What's up everyone, back here with another review video. This time I've got a little bit of a different kind of review video for you, my first music review. The band is Greta Van Fleet, and this album is The Battle at Garden's Gate. This is their second album. Uh, their debut was from 2018, so a few years ago, uh, which was called Anthem of the Peaceful Army. Very okay album. It was very okay. Good rock stuff. Uh, but way to make us wait. They get compared to Led Zeppelin a lot, sound-wise, but very un -Led Zeppelin like to make us wait so long when when Zeppelin first came out they were putting out one or two albums a year it was crazy and uh, they got a new producer they're recording uh, not in Nashville this time uh, almost all these songs all of them save for two of them were recorded at Henson Recording Studios in Los Angeles and their new producer Greg Kirsten who worked with he's worked with Adele Kelly Clarkson the Foo Fighters Paul McCartney so he's been around, and uh, from interviews, they really like this producer. He gave him a lot of creative freedom and uh, just let him go crazy, which is awesome. So good for Greta Van Fleet for finding a great producer. That's kind of the kind of the kind of producer every band wishes they could find. So uh, that's pretty great. This band, uh, it's it's mostly brothers. Three of them are brothers. Four man band. Josh Kiska is the vocalist, and then you got the guitarist. Jacob Kiska, his twin brother, who's a, who's a total Gibson man. Gib, Gibson guitar is like me. He plays a Gibson SG. He's got a 61 Les Paul. You can definitely tell just by listening to it. Oh, man, he's playing some Gibson guitars. Really rocking. And uh, bassist is their younger brother, Sam Kiska, who also plays the piano and the organ, uh, you know, much like Led Zeppelin's bass player, uh, John Paul Jones. And then you got Danny Wagner, who's like a brother to them on the drums. Really good drummer. They're a bunch of young guys, early 20s, from Frankenmuth, Michigan. And going to get right into this songs. So track number one is called Heat Above. I love this song. This is a great song. I actually just saw them perform on, it was Jimmy Fallon or Jimmy Kimmel uh, playing this song and a bunch of cool sparks and, and like fireworks were flying down from them during the outro. I love the outro. It took the song to the next step. Just listen to it. After, after this pause, there's some fun guitar work with a really warm tone. Uh, you got this organ plus the acoustic guitar during the verses. Uh, the, the drums pounding, pounding on the toms right when the singer says this, the ground bump bump line. Uh, it, it really drives it home. Uh, and the song is probably about the title of this album, The Battle at Garden's Gate. They had a goal uh, to, to, to do an album very cinematically. They want all these songs telling these little kind of smaller stories, but all going into this larger story. So they really want to tell uh, the, this album's story kind of scene by scene with their songs. Track number two, I really love the song, a little more rocking, and this one was almost, it kind of had a southern vibe, almost, almost Leonard Skinner-like, and it's got an awesome guitar riff, it's more rocking guitar tone, fun and energetic song. It's got lyrics like, I've packed my bags and I've got my freedom, I've sacked the rules so I don't have to heed them, I'll bet on a chance if I've just got one, I'll throw out the plans and live with no burden. I love that stuff. That's good stuff. Simple, relatable theme. That's what I look for in bands like this. Uh, that's real rock and roll to me. It's not complicated. Going into track number three, this is the first boring song. <laughs> There's a lot of boring stuff on this album, but the definitely the first half uh, is mostly the stuff that I enjoyed. Uh, but this one is kind of boring, Broken Bells, uh, for being one of the songs that they used uh, to promote this album. But it's got a good use of violin and cello in it. That's about all I can say about that one. Uh, next track is called Built by Nations. Uh, the subject of this song's lyrics goes into the perspective of these warriors fighting this battle, which goes into the album's overall story, uh, with a band of brothers kind of perspective. It's got a cool riff, uh, more pulverizing rock. Uh, it kind of reminded me of Black Sabbath, this one, so I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have mind even if they leaned more into Black Sabbath kind of sound. Going into the next track, Age of Machine, it opens with this faint, ominous guitar picking with a slow, steady buildup. It reminds me of an old Western movie, like an old spaghetti Western. I listen to the beginning and I just imagine Clint Eastwood or Charles Bronson riding in on a horse. Uh, it's got lyrics like, 
Whoa, the trouble gets so loud when all the hell tries to drag you down. Whoa, the wounded warrior on this battleground. Who is he to think of his survival uh, when a man must kill his home? And uh, kind of some stuff that doesn't make sense. <laughs> and uh, tells a different kind of story. I think uh, he's trying to say that since we're born attached to technology, I guess. And uh, it the song uh, is big sonically, and that's impressive uh, uh, to me. But the song itself is a little boring. Next, we've got the sixth track. I'm going to spend the most time talking about this one because this was my favorite song on the entire album. I love this song. This is a beautiful song. I love it. It opens with this acoustic guitar playing very sullen. And, uh, and then Josh Kiska really keeps the song going and building up with his vocals. By now, at this point, listening to the album, I'm really impressed with his range. Uh, then there's a pause or a bridge carried by the piano, wonderfully played by Sam Kiska. And then some, some great simple pentatonic lead guitar with the perfect warm tone, with the perfect amount of reverb. Very, very classic rock sound uh, from the guitar. Uh, and it's played on top of some acoustic guitar chord strumming. The band is really joining in by this point uh, with the drums and the bass. And I, I'm, I'm not kidding, really. Listen to this song. The outro is so cool. And uh, Josh Kiska is singing this line, Who Will Bring the Rain, repeatedly with some great background harmonizing. It's so happy and uplifting sounding. Lyrically... It's quite sad. <laughs> I don't know if he is writing this from the depressed point of view or even suicidal point of view of this album's long battle type theme, or Josh read the book of Genesis and was inspired by the flood. Uh, but it's got lyrics like praying to God or, or a God to, to bring a flood and end their suffering. I don't know if they're leaving it open for interpretation. I also don't know if they're Christian, but I choose to believe uh, because of the uplifting outro that the point of view of this song is facing God's promise to never flood the earth again. Uh, there's nothing more uplifting than that unabandonment by the Lord. And I think that's what this band's goal was to do with giving an outro like that, stark contrasting the lyrical subject of the song that is very sad. Uh, it ends with this sound of, of like a storm like rainfall hitting the ground, which which of course reminded me of Riders uh, on the Storm by the Doors. And uh, that kind of gave me the new thought that it could be from the point of view of the people living on the earth after the flood, uh, because that uh, started, you know, getting rainfall. They didn't, they, they never seen rainfall before, before the flood. And now they, they, they face that and are reminded why they have that or something. Uh, and these two sullen piano notes uh, played, I think, in the key of D-sharp, correct me if I'm wrong, and it just ends the song there. I listen to this song, and by the end, I'm given such a feeling of hope and comfort. I really love it. It's a beautiful song. Going into the next track, or now now we're in the second half of the album, or, or the B-side, as I think of it, because uh, uh, back in the day when you listen to vinyl records, uh, which a lot of people are listening to now, uh, there's... There's A side and the B side, and you know now we got track seven through twelve, so it's the second half. So I kind of think of this as the B side, not as strong of a side. It's in fact I kind of only like one song really uh, on this whole side. It's it's kind of boring from here on out. And you've got uh, track number seven, Stardust Chords. It's very it has a very orchestrated opening, kind of fun groove with the way the song is sang, bopping back and forth with the striking of the guitar chords. Uh, the lyrics, it's something about planting seeds for wine and being held captive by the king. Uh, I, I, it's a little too heady for me. I can't decipher it. <laughs> and then you got the next song, Light My Love. Finally, it's just a love song, straight up love song. Uh, not that that's all I need, nor do I want it put so simply, but Greta Van Fleet is more than welcome to put their spin on a love song, which we've seen them do many times in the past. And uh, But it's kind of an offshoot from the rest of the album. Uh, so it sticks out like a sore thumb, and uh, it's got good drumming. I haven't been giving enough uh, credit to Danny Wagner. He's got really good drumming, uh, very well balanced. Uh, he's a fantastic drummer, and it shows in this track. Uh, next, you got uh, Caravel. This this was my favorite song on this side of the album. So this is the first of the two songs that is recorded at a different studio, No Expectation Studio in Hollywood, California. We're back to rock in this pure song or this in this song, it's pure rock, uh, overdrive guitar, 
sweet riff, very Zeppelin-y, uh, with the band jamming out to each other. I had to look up what a what a caravel is. According to Merriam-Webster, it's a small 15th and 16th century ship uh, with broad bows, high narrow poop, and uh, and usually three masts with a latine or both square and latine sails. So that was interesting that it gave a setting time-wise to the album's story, which I'm sure Josh Kiska was reluctant to do, which is probably why he saved it for the ninth track. Uh, but he really wanted to tell this uh, immigrant song style uh, story of traveling from one place to another. That's the, that's the feeling that I got from this one. Next track, we got The Barbarians, the second of the two songs recorded at No Expectation Studio. Uh, I didn't like this one. <laughs> it, it was another one of the boring ones, but he's singing about warriors uh, who are typically uh, very dutiful people and uh, doing their time. But through the title's namesake, uh, he's referring to them as barbarians. Uh, and then there's something about Babylon, which is way in the past, <laughs> which kind of contradicts the the 15th or 16th century setting he gave it in the last song. So he's going way into Old Testament era even, uh, which, you know, for you history buffs, Babylon was, it was not a good place or, or an empire, I should say. Uh, it, was a, it was a brutal city that became an empire uh, with a worldview very defiant of God and was responsible for the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, doing a lot of damage to you know, the people of God. And of course, uh, you know, Babylon is judged likewise as, as the emperor or as the empire uh, fell, uh, ultimately. Uh, so then we got the next song, Trip the Light Fantastic, which is a really weird title. Uh, this one should be a fun song, but it comes off as a little generic and forgettable. And uh, lyrically, it's very happy. You know, carbon dancing through time is uh, some of the lyrics. No surprise after the last song uh, uh, mentioning Babylon, uh, which was a place known for its self-indulgence and doing whatever you want. Uh, there's a lot of vocal harmonizing that is really, uh, it's weird. It's chanting the name Rama, which is, uh, which is either an ancient Hindu god or it's referring to one of the descendants of Noah. Uh, which goes back to the flood reference uh, of of that song, uh, Tears of Rain. Or it could be referencing one of the many cities in the Old Testament. Uh, first, be, The first one being the one uh, mentioned in the book of Joshua, which was fortified by the king of the Israelites. Then we got the 12th track, the, the song to uh, close out the album. This is the longest song on the album called Weight of Dreams. It clocks in at 8 minutes 45 seconds. Uh, it's got guitar picking similar to Dazed and Confused. Just listen to it and you'll you'll hear the, the similarities as well. Uh, it's got lyrics like gold mines melting men in the sunshine. Spoiled wine tastes so sweet we have gone blind. Uh, I'm, I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? So yeah, he kind of kind of ended it kind of kind of weird. It doesn't doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I want to tell like Josh, like, hey, some of your lyrics are really good, but you can also get so grandiose and existential that it, that it's 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 it just doesn't make sense. I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? And uh, but it's got a really awesome guitar solo, really awesome guitar work, and uh, the musicianship is so good in this song. They really play off each other really well. It honestly should have been an instrumental. You know, it really should have been. Uh, I heard them talking about this song. I heard one of them. Uh, being interviewed, saying that uh, that they 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 stretch this song out way long live. I would really like to see them play this song live, and uh, that they I think this song really evolved and was one thing, or maybe even multiple songs that they kind of combined into one. They were very attached to it, so it was kind of it's, it's kind of cool to to them that they got to keep it and put it in this album and end the album with it, since they clearly have so much fun playing it. Uh, so uh, good for that. So now I'm going to talk about uh, the album's physical copy, which yes, I do buy CDs. I even buy uh, vinyl records, which which you know maybe even have uh, better sales than CDs these days. But I got the CD. You can go get the vinyl record for for those of you hardcore fans. But it's really it's really fancy. It's kind of uh, it's kind of got this very thick, very interesting paper. It's textured. It's got some interesting uh, album 
cover art on it, and it's got this golden kind of print, this uh, shine to it. And uh, it's really cool, folds open, and it's got some really gorgeous artwork, very interesting. These same pictures you would see uh, with the lyrics printed inside the little booklet, and it's even embossed, so it feels, uh, these images kind of stick out right there. So a uh, pretty fancy uh, uh, album physical copy, so uh, they definitely didn't cheap out there. Really, uh, really cool to just to just hold and look at, you know, for a little bit. So, uh, you know, that's pretty cool. Yeah. As for the album, so uh, this was uh, this was pretty good. This is good stuff, you know. Uh, uh, definitely the best stuff to in in the mainstream rock world. And if, if if there is if rock is mainstream these days, uh, these guys are it. So I'm sure this album is selling really well. It's a pretty good album. They get compared to Led Zeppelin a lot, and uh, it definitely shows here. I remember that they said a little early on uh, for for doing their next album, they wanted to they wanted to change course and sound different. And I was kind of like, no, why? No, give us give us some of that good old rock. And they still are. They did change. They tried to get a little bigger. And, uh, you know, the, the lyrics, Josh Kiska is getting really kind of existential and heady. I don't, I think he should lay off that stuff a little bit, you know, uh, maybe uh, as like a 20 year old guy, maybe he needs to live his life a little more before he gets that heady, but the instrumentation is really good. Uh, I think it is a step up from their first album. A lot of people are very critical on this band for being so similar to Zeppelin. And, uh, as I said, when I, when I first heard them and really judged, judged them, and, uh, and I'm critical because I, I love Led Zeppelin. And I said, no, they, they don't really sound like Led Zeppelin, uh, except for the singer. People, I think, are getting that confused with Josh Kiska. Uh, and really, he bears similarities to sounding like Robert Plant when he sings high-pitched. And uh, he gets really screechy when he sings high-pitched. But when he sings high and doesn't get screechy and he just sings his pure voice, then you can hear the similarities to Robert Plant. Uh, other than that, uh, with this album, <laughs> then this album came out and it's like, yeah, there's, there's a lot of Led Zeppelin influence in here. And, uh, you know, tip, like I, I listened to it and I thought like they just locked themselves in a room and listened to Led Zeppelin albums, like things like Led Zeppelin three and physical graffiti. And they said like, let's do this stuff. So that's definitely the kind of stuff they put out. But I'm cool with it. Some other people aren't cool with it. Like, oh, Greta Van Fleet needs to be doing new stuff. I say, uh, uh, well, that's that's kind of a weird thing to say when we're so bankrupt of good rock now. I mean, there's there's no there's no no other really new good rock bands kind of filling the void, save for a few. Like I said, I'm waiting for that Dirty Honey new album to come come out. And uh, they're like the best. They're, they're, they don't, it doesn't get more rocking than Dirty Honey. But uh, yeah, Greta Van Fleet, good stuff, good album. Wish people would give them more of a chance. And in fact, I think when they first came out, a lot of young people really liked them. But then uh, older people liked them too. Like, hey, like a new band came out that sounds like our old stuff. And uh, for some reason, I think that made the younger audience of Greta Van Fleet kind of turn on them a little more. You're like, oh, they're actually lame. It's like, no, they're not. They're really, they're really great. Uh, this was a solid album. So it is a recommend. Go listen uh, to this song while you're driving, you know, having a good drive in your car with the, the sun shining. That, that's probably the best, uh, that's probably the best way to listen to this album, I would say. So thanks for listening to this video. I'll talk to you later.